Fire Nation in the house, JLD here, and welcome to episode 1691 of EO Fire, where I chat with today's most inspiring entrepreneurs seven days a week. Create your dream life one step at a time, Fire Nation, howtofinallywin.com. Check it out to find out more. Now I'll share with today's featured guest, Jeff Goins. Jeff, are you prepared to ignite? John, I was born ignited. Yes. <laughs> Jeff is a full-time <laughs> writer who lives just outside of Nashville, Tennessee with his wife, two children, and Border Collie. He's the author of four, count them, four books, including the national bestseller, The Art of Work. His website, goinswriter.com, has been visited by more than four million people from all over the world. Jeff, take a minute, fill in some gaps from that intro and give us a little glimpse of your personal life. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me back, John. 1700. Man, this is, I, I literally think it's been a thousand interviews since the last time we talked. <laughs> it's been close. I have the exact number here, but I'll let of you course, talk first. Of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, things are, things are good. Um, yeah, basically, uh, I'm a writer who helps other writers and I, uh, for the past, been doing this for the past five years and have learned a lot about, uh, what it takes to be a creative and also be in business and struggle through a lot of those problems. So if you're a creative entrepreneur, uh, I'm excited about sharing some lessons that I've uh, learned over these past five years and things that I think uh, we don't hear enough as creatives who also you know, want to be in the business of sharing our art with the world. Wow. Well, I love all of that in Fire Nation. We have a special episode ahead of us today because as Jeff mentioned, this actually is not his first rodeo. It's his fourth rodeo. He was episode 454. He was episode 877. He was episode 1180, which is 530 episodes ago, which is just boop, mind blowing. And wow. we're going to have a really good chat today about your latest book, Jeff, Real Artists Don't Starve. So let's talk about that real quick. Why did you write that book and what do you hope at the core that this book accomplishes? I was actually just talking about this um, uh, on a Facebook Live thing because I think that people write books for the wrong reasons. We write a book because we had an experience at one point that you know we're really emotionally connected to and we think other people should be emotionally connected to. And in and of itself, I don't think that's a good enough reason to write a book. I think that sometimes we write books because we think we have an original idea. You know, I, mm. I go to conference, I go to conferences and I meet authors and they go, I have this idea for a book and no <laughs> book like this has ever been written before. And, and either one of two things is true. One, uh, you just haven't done your homework and there's tons of books like that, which there probably are, right. uh, cause nothing, cause, cause half a million books are published every year. It's an insane amount. Um, or there's a reason, you know, there, there is no book that that's, that's been published like this and there's a reason for that. There's no demand for it. Um, and, and then, you know, some people write books cause they want to be rich and famous, which is, you know, laughable. Uh, this is actually my <laughs> fifth book and, um, you know, it's, uh, you don't have to starve, but I mean, it's not the fastest way to, you know, make a great living. And so I, you know, I think you write a book because it needs to be written. And this idea of being a starving artist is something that I struggled with for about seven years. You know, I was going through some, uh, our first interview where you ask people like, what, you know, what is like your worst entrepreneurial moment? If I could go back and change my answer uh, to that, I would say, my worst entrepreneurial moment was the seven years of sitting on the couch before I even became an entrepreneur. And I believe this myth of a starving artist, which was basically, uh, if I'm going to be creative, there's no way that I could make a living off of my art. And, you know, I, I hope we all understand art as something more than painting these days. It is your creative gift that you have to share with the world. And I wrote this book because I, I kept running into two different groups of people, John. One people who were starving, struggling, and I live in Nashville, so lots of musicians, authors, even aspiring entrepreneurs and people who have this great idea, but they just lack the confidence, they lack the mindset to believe that it's even possible to win, to succeed uh, in their you know chosen field. And then I kept meeting another group of people that I call thriving artists who were killing it. And these were designers. These were writers. These were speakers. These were uh, people who had big ideas that they were sharing with the world, and they were making more than a meager living off of their art. And I realized, wait, there's two stories here, and depending on which one you believe tends to affect your fate. And so I wrote this book because I believe – 
And being a starving artist is no longer uh, something that's a necessary condition of doing creative work, whatever that means to you. I think quite simply, it's a choice. It is a choice. And there's those two paths, Fire Nation. Of course, you're going to go down one of those. Why not have that mindset of abundance? Why not read the books, listen to the podcast, do the things that are going to get you to that path that you're a thriving artist, not that starving artist. Now, Jeff, you do something cool because, again, you're a thriving artist. You're not a starving artist where, you know, you don't just kind of write a book and then kind of quietly launch it on Amazon and kind of hope people start to buy and, you know, maybe you don't even mention it if nobody does. You, you know, you do launches right. You've done multiple launches right. You know, a recent launch that you crushed was The Art of Work. It became a national bestseller. What are you doing for Real Artists Don't Starve? Uh, we have this pretty cool thing where you know you don't just kind of have this book, but there's bonuses and there's other yeah. opportunities. And so I kind of want to get into that real quick. And by the way, Fire Nation, really simple. Everything that Jeff's talking about today, eofire.com slash starve. Head over there and you're going to get everything he's about to talk about. So let's kind of dive into that, Jeff. But plus, while you're doing that, I think it'd be cool about sharing the why behind this kind of launch and why you're doing this because it goes to that thriving artist mentality. First of all, the idea of being a starving artist is a myth. Uh, there's a study that I read that, that comes out every year, uh, and it's called the SNAP study, uh, SNAP with two A's, and it's Strategic National Arts Alumni Project. Uh, they came out with a report in 2016, and again, you know, I, I don't know what you heard growing up, John, but I, I was always into art and music and writing, and I almost heard – you know, a consensus from teachers, parents, friends, all well-meaning people saying, you can't do that. You're going to starve. And this study kind of debunks this idea. What they do is every year they survey about 30, 40,000 uh, graduate students from different arts programs. So like the traditional path towards becoming an artist. And the numbers that they find are really startling. They basically find that uh, over 80% of the people uh, who studied some sort of creative field uh, go on to be uh, incredibly satisfied with their jobs. I mean, here's the interesting numbers. Um, uh, Eighty-seven percent find that in their job right now they have the opportunity to be creative. Eighty-seven uh, percent are doing things that reflect their values, interests, personality. Uh, 89% are overall satisfied wow. with their jobs. And remember that study from several years ago where it was the opposite, yeah. where like nine, nine out of 10 people hate their jobs? <laughs> uh, so anyway, so it was just like one of those things where I was like, my mind was blown and I realized, wow, if you believe one story, that tends to come true. And if you believe another story, that tends to come true. So um, I wrote this book, and the reason why we do book launches the way that we do them, trying to get lots of people to pre-order the book and get that out into people's hands, is you know for a few reasons. One, you hear an idea about a book, and you go, oh, I'm going to get that someday. And if there's no reason to get you to buy it now, then you – put it off. And so we do pre-order bonuses like we're doing with you and appreciate you helping us get the word yeah. out about that um, because it just helps get the book into more people's hands and it helps the idea spread faster. Now, sometimes people say that and they're trying to game a bestseller list and all that. like we're really not interested in that. We're just trying to get the book into as many people's hands as possible. So if you uh, get the book, Real Artists Don't Starve and you sign up through John's link, eofire.com uh, slash starve, uh, we're going to give you an entire um, – video course, an online course that I shot with these 12 lessons, these 12 rules uh, on how to stop being a starving artist in whatever your field is. Because uh, I talk to entrepreneurs all the time who have the starving artist mentality. John, one of the things that I think people don't realize is you can have a million, two million, three, five, ten million dollar business and be broke mm -hmm. because of how you're running the business, because of the lies that you're believing about uh, you know, a certain style of entrepreneurship. And so this is a course that really gets you thinking like a thriving artist, and this is something that we give you for free. Uh, plus you know, the, uh, transcripts of interviews I did with all these thriving artists. You can get all the, the, the firsthand interviews. I did, a, I did a bunch of original research uh, around this book, and we've got an online community that you get to be a part of just by getting the book ahead of time eofire.com slash starve fire nation. You want to get over there. You definitely want to make sure that you take advantage of these bonuses because you're going to want to read the book anyway. So why not just get the pre-order in, get the bonuses because it's 
Awesome. Now, one thing I do want to say, and this is just something that someone said literally yesterday to Kate. I mean, we were having a conversation. Someone was like, Kate, what was your major in college? She was like, oh, I was an English major. And they're like, ho, 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 ho. That's, you know, <laughs> that's what people do when they, you know, don't know what they want to do with the real world. And uh, oh, of course, you know, you, you can't make any money with that. And, you know, that's the same thing with art majors and history right. majors. And yeah, yeah. I was a history major. So Kate's oh, heard wow. that over and over again. I've heard yeah. that over and over again. You know, fortunately... I'm not going to say fortunately for me, but, you know, when I was in college and people would make that kind of chuckle laugh, I would say, well, you know, I'm actually an ROTC, too, so I'm going to be in the Army after. They're like, oh, okay, that's a real job. Now, you know, (laughs) I was like, oh, okay, well, and, you know, that's the thing where we just have this misconception, especially the generations, you know, that are older than us, you know, that are like in their 50s, 60s, 70s, like that's the generations where they have this, for some reason, idea that English, any, any of the liberal arts, like the creative majors right. are just, you're going straight to the curb and you're begging for money. That's the thing. And I love those stats you shared, Jeff, that, to show that that's just not the, not the case. But number two, that these people are happy to do these things. Like they're, yeah. they're literally happy with what they do. And I want right. to kind of hit one more point that you made that I thought was brilliant about how people that make millions of dollars in revenue doesn't necessarily mean that their net profit is anything to be proud of. And a great show that I'm actually watching, because I just I, I watched this show over and over again because I learned so much from Marcus Limonis, is The Profits. And he, every time goes in, you know, the most recent episode that I watched was about this blue jean company made $13 million with just three stores, but they were losing $400,000 a year. So why do you yeah. want to run a company like that? I mean, you know, you want to have a company with a profit margin and net and actual net profit. So really interesting thing around, around this and some themes from your book that I actually am kind of curious about is your comment about there's no such thing as a lone genius. Every creation is collaboration. And for me, you know, I just kind of picture, you know, the Walden Pond, you know, he's by himself and he's just typing that. So what do you mean by this? (laughs) Right. So, you know, I mean, uh, certainly there uh, are times when we have to go alone and create something by ourselves. Uh, But I found there's been lots of really interesting research behind this. There's a researcher by the name of Keith Sawyer who's written some really great books. Most notably is uh, the book Group Genius. And in that book, he basically debunks the idea of the lone genius. And he says from, you know, all of the creations of Thomas Edison, which we now know was not just him alone. In fact, many, many cases it wasn't him at all. He was managing a team of hundreds of workers. Uh, Sigmund Freud, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, all kind of the modern psychology stuff and even literature like uh, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, all of these people were a part of basic, what we would call masterminds today, collaborations where they would get together and they would share their uh, ideas with one another. And so yeah, it's true that J.R.R. Tolkien did go right the Hobbit and um, the uh, Lord of the Rings by himself. But what's also true is he wouldn't have written it without being a part of this literary group called the Inklings that uh, was 19 men that met for decades. And my favorite story about this, John, is when Tolkien had written The Hobbit, it had done pretty well. The publisher wanted him to write a new book that he called The New Hobbit. And he wrote a few chapters and he was bored out of his mind. And so he asked his friend Jack, C.S. Lewis, to go out to lunch because they were part of this literary group that met every week on a Tuesday night. They would get together. They'd, uh, they'd Where did smoke, they live? Uh, in Oxford, oh, in England. Cool. Yeah, they were all professors at Oxford. Uh, and they'd get together uh, in a classroom, in, in one of their classrooms, and they'd uh, drink tea and uh, you know they'd, they'd smoke their pipes and talk about <laughs> literature. And each of them had to bring something to read. And so uh, one day these two friends go out to lunch and um, J.R. Tolkien tells – uh, C.S. Lewis, he says, man, I'm bored out of my mind. I can't finish this book. And the publisher wants it. And I'm you know, way past my deadline. And uh, Lewis says to Tolkien, he says, well, Tolkien, don't you know, because he was familiar with his friend's work. He says, don't you know that hobbits are only interesting when you put them in unhobbit like circumstances? Mm. And, you know, if, you, if you've seen The Lord of the Rings, you go, oh, yeah. Have you seen The Hobbit? You go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> like, 
like like it's like life is kind of idyllic and sort of boring until you know something bad happens and they leave the Shire and then all the adventure happens. But this is like you know Tolkien was like oh yeah I forgot you know <laughs> and and then he goes back and he starts writing what became Lord of the Rings and every week he shared bits and pieces of that huge book uh, that he wrote. He shared it with this mastermind group and it took him years to write and there was a point where a lot of people were sick of hearing all these stories of hobbits uh, but he would not. Uh, have written that book without the help and guidance and feedback from that group of people. And uh, I have found, I mean, you pick any single creative from Beyonce back to Shakespeare, and and it's hard to find somebody who is a, a truly creative genius who wasn't a part of a group in some form or another like this. I love that story. I mean, I just love stories in general. And Jeff, you just told this great story. I mean, I was picturing the Inklings getting together, smoking their pipes. I mean, <laughs> this is what we talk about. When we talk about masterminds, Fire Nation, important stuff. And Jeff, there's a quote that you use that I just really want to pick up on and just share with Fire Nation right now. It's that thriving artists, they don't make art to make money. They make money to make more art. So just kind of think about that phrase, Fire Nation. Kind of let it sink in. We're going to go take a quick break to thank our sponsors and we'll be right back. We can't all be creatives, Fire Nation, which is why we're lucky to have amazing crowdsourcing sites to help us with the things we're not that great at. Take iStock by Getty Images, for example. You can find user-generated, royalty-free, authentic imagery for your next project with a click of a button iStock is the original source for user-generated stock photos, vectors, and illustrations. So no matter what type of project you're working on, flyers, presentations, your website, iStock has you covered. You can even find and download images on the go with the iStock app. You deserve to make a big impact through your work without breaking the bank, which is why iStock offers a range of convenient plans from no commitment options to flexible subscriptions. Cut through the marketplace with only authentic imagery by using iStock today. Visit iStockphoto.com slash podcast fire and grab your code for 20% off any product. That's iStockphoto.com slash podcast fire for 20% off. Fire Nation, are you looking for premium stock footage or a music track for your next big project? If so, I've got the perfect duo for you, Video Blocks and Audio Blocks. Video Blocks is a subscription-based stock media site that gives you unlimited access to premium stock footage, and Audio Blocks has a library of over 100,000 music tracks, sound effects, and loops. Unlike some other stock sites, downloads from Video Blocks and Audio Blocks are yours forever and 100% royal free. This month, Video Blocks is launching its latest collection, Creator to Creator, where they'll be featuring videos and music from creators just like you. Visit videoblocks.com slash fire for a two for one deal. Get audio blocks for free when you sign up for your $149 Video Blocks subscription. That's video blocks, V-I-D-E-O-B-L-O-C-K-S dot com slash fire. So Jeff, we're back and Fire Nation, eofire.com slash starve. That's going to get you to where you need to be to pre-order this amazing book and get all those bonuses that Jeff has been talking about. And again, we'll go over those again at the end of the show, but just make sure eofire.com slash starve is where you go to snag your pre-order of this book. Now, how does Real Artists Don't Starve actually stand out from other books that are currently in the marketplace, Jeff? I mean, you shared that number. It's a massive number of how many books get published every year. How is this different? When I write a book, um, first thing I, I do is I, um, I do what I think anybody does. You have some sort of experience. You have an idea and you go, oh, I should write a book about that. And uh, I have lots of ideas like this. And I'd been thinking about this starving artist thing for so long because what I had experienced, you know, I, I mentioned my worst entrepreneurial moment was sitting on the couch for seven years, dreaming of working for myself, being a full-time author, just wondering you know, can I even do that and not doing anything? And then eventually I did do some stuff. And and as you talk about, I started listening to podcasts. I started attending events, buying books, just trying to learn, becoming a student again, which I think is really important, having an attitude of apprenticeship. And I found that, okay, this is possible. Um, and it's 
it's not easy, but it's not ridiculously hard, like one in a million chances, like a lot of people talk about it. You know, it wasn't about luck. It was just kind of hard work. And I kept running into people that were like, oh, you know, that's great that you did that, but I could never do that. And then I kept running into people who kept doing it, you know, and I was like, this is weird. And so I was like, okay, I should write a book about how to not be a starving artist. And then I went out and tried to find as many books as I possibly could on this subject. So you've got, uh, you know, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's book, Creativity, which is a great book about the study of creativity, how it works and how to be creative. Then you've got, you know, more practical stuff like Austin Kleon's book, Steal Like an Artist, a great book on just how to, you know, do more artistic work. And we all want to be like more and more of us are thinking of our work as art of, of some form. But I couldn't find a book like the one that I wanted to write where it was like they're like uh, – uh, Real Artists Don't Starve is – each chapter is a rule. Do these things and you will succeed. You will thrive. Don't do these things and you'll probably starve. And I couldn't find something that was basically a manual for how to be an artist. Again, whatever that means to you, you know, how to be a creative in today's society with the technology and opportunities that we have that have never really existed before like they do. Um, I wanted to – we say, you know, like it's, it is a choice now. You, you don't have to starve if you're willing to do the work and here's how you do the work. And I think in that respect, it's building on, you know, what other authors have said, uh, but it's contributing something new to this space. Jeff, let's end this interview with a final story. I mean, you've already told that one amazing story and Michelangelo, he was the richest artist of the Renaissance. And I have no idea why, and I'm sure most of Fire Nation doesn't know the real reasons why. Maybe one or two of you guys. I'm sorry if I'm offending you, but why was Michelangelo the richest artist of the Renaissance? First thing, like I didn't know this. I don't. I mean, did you know this? Had you ever heard this before? No. Uh, like I, I, this was news to me. And a friend of mine years ago sent me an article about this. And this guy named Rab Hatfield, who is an American professor uh, living in Florence, Italy, discovered in 2003, he discovered all these old bank accounts that belonged to the artist Michelangelo. And he was trying to date the different um, scenes of the Sistine Chapel. The Sistine Chapel took a few years to paint. And he was going – he was looking at it going, OK, when did Michelangelo paint that part of it? And he was trying to track the letters that Michelangelo had written uh, with the bank records. He's like, oh, you know, if I go to the bank and I find out when they gave him his commission because it came in installments, then I could find out when he, you know, painted this this thing. He goes to the he, he goes to the city records and he looks up, you know, the he, he told me this. I called this guy and this eighty year old professor in Florence. He told me this story. He goes, so I went in there and I looked up the letter M, <laughs> and, <laughs> and and he and he found massive amounts of money that startled him. And everybody knew that Michelangelo had done well, but nobody had any idea that he was, as you said, the richest artist of the Renaissance. And he was actually at that time uh, the richest artist who had ever lived of all time. He had a fortune worth over $50 million wow. uh, to his name. And a lot of that was in property and all these different things. So how did he do it? Well, I mean, he did a couple of interesting things that are kind of counterintuitive to us today in terms of you know what we think creatives do. First of all, he was not a lone genius, as we said. He had a project, John. A lot of people don't know this. I didn't know this until I started studying him. Uh, for the last 40 years of his life, he lived to almost 100. The last 40 years of his life, he was a construction foreman. Uh, for this building, this this chapel that he was commissioned to build, and he had hundreds of people working for him. He was literally an entrepreneur. Uh, so that was the one thing. He was an organizer of labor, uh, and he had other people working for him all the time. The second thing he did that uh, I don't think we talk a, a, uh, enough about in kind of entrepreneurial culture is he had multiple sources of income. He had a portfolio of work. He did different things. He started out as a sculptor, uh, but then – he had a bet. He he bet Leonardo da Vinci that he could paint better than him, and and he didn't want to be showed up because Leonardo da Vinci was like, ah, oh, sculpture isn't a real art, and so that's how Michelangelo got into painting. He's like, oh, figure painting out, and then eventually he got into architecture. Uh, you know, I mentioned the you know how he was a foreman. He did these different things, and I think sometimes uh, when we go, oh, this is what I do, and this is all that I do, uh, we miss the opportunities to kind of expand our portfolio, and and his doing that made him really, really 
rich and also a much better artist because he was borrowing from you know one craft and applying it to something else sculpture taught him about architecture uh, architecture and painting worked together uh, and so you know he did these things in a smart way lastly I think you know one of the reasons he was very successful is he actually wasn't doing it for the money I, I mean I think he wanted to be successful but he was a master craftsman and as I said um, as you said, you know, we don't make art to make money because I think we can all sense that when somebody's out to get a quick buck, whatever that is, whether you've got a blog or you've got, you know, uh, a, a Facebook page, or you've got a podcast and you're trying to get attention and then very quickly turn it into revenue and you're not there to serve people. Uh, I think we can sense that. And Michelangelo, uh, was arguably one of the greatest artists who had ever lived and, uh, his dedication to that craft uh, made him very, very successful. But he understood that if the money stops coming in, the art stops going out. And so we don't make art to make money, but we do make money to make more art. And he was really, really good at both. Wow. I mean, mind blowing. $50 million. Was that in his time or $50 million in our time? Yeah. I mean, that's adjusted for our time. Okay. Still, just an absolutely insane number. Think about that, Fire Nation. Now, Jeff, I want to hand the mic back over to you. Bring us home. Let's have a final call to action for Fire Nation for Real Artists Don't Starve. Uh, what do you got for us? If you are thinking that um, you have to be broke to do whatever it is that you're doing, whether you're working for a company, whether you're a freelancer, whether you're you know, uh, starting out with a, a blog or a podcast and you're trying to do what John does – and you believe that you have to starve or struggle or suffer for the sake of this this thing that you're doing, this passion, you're wrong. That's a choice. The opportunity to be creative and to thrive has never, never been better. Uh, as long as you're willing to to follow in the footsteps of those who have come before you, not assume that you're different from everybody else. I had a conversation with somebody recently where, where they were telling me that there were no jobs in marketing. You know, out, like like this person couldn't find any jobs in the field of marketing. I was like, "There's like a ton of jobs in this field." <laughs> yeah, I mean, like it was just, but it, but that was that was the story that this person was telling right. themselves. And when you tell a story to yourself enough times, it becomes true. So my call to action is: if you are starving, if you are struggling, I don't want to minimize that, but uh, that's a choice, and you can choose to not do that. And that doesn't mean your reality changes tomorrow or a few months from now. But if you do the work, you're going to see the results and your art, your creative work that needs to get out into the world uh, deserves to thrive. Um, and I think the scariest thing is for our work to, you know, die, our best work for us to, you know, die with us. So um, uh, if you, you know, want to get this book, go to eofire.com slash starve. And that's a special link where you're going to get a whole uh, online video course um, just for, you know, reading the book and, and participating in it. Um, my gift to you. So thanks again for having me. Wow. Love it all. And Jeff, I want to thank you, brother, for sharing your journey with Fire Nation today. For that, we salute you and we'll catch you on the flip side. Thank you, John. Hey, Fire Nation. Hope you enjoyed our chat with Jeff today. And one more time, eofire.com slash starve. That's going to get you all that great awesomeness. And if you want to accomplish your number one goal in 100 days, visit thefreedomjournal.com because you'll be able to do just that and use promo code podcast. And you're a podcast listener for a nice little discount. And I'll catch you there or I'll catch you on the flip side. Looking for premium stock footage of a music track for your next big project? If so, I've got the perfect duo for you, Video Blocks and Audio Blocks. Visit videoblocks.com slash fire for a two-for-one deal. Get Audio Blocks for free when you sign up for your $149 Video Blocks subscription today at videoblocks.com slash fire. 93% of people say that visuals are the defining factor in purchasing decisions. Thankfully, iStock offers millions of bold, unique stock images, vectors, and illustrations that can help you make a big impact without breaking the bank. Try iStock today and find the image your idea deserves. Visit iStockphoto.com slash podcast fire to grab your code for 20% off any product.